So welcome back to another Song Explorer and today I'm going to be looking at Two Is Too Too Many which is a recent track that I wrote under my Elite Force guise. Let's kick off by just giving it a bit of a listen and then I'll dive into some of the inspirations and influences that went into the making of this track and then I'll go into a bit more detail and pick apart one or two of the production techniques that I use to achieve it. Uh, as you can see here it's actually 85 channels of audio that have gone into building this track up and it's very much in keeping with a, a kind of heavy full spectrum like wall of sound style production technique that um, that I, I, I really kind of favor on these kinds of tracks anyway for starters let's have a little listen to one or two sections of it I'll play maybe a minute at the beginning drop somewhere into the middle and then we'll listen to a bit of the play out and then we'll be right back with some analysis of how it came to pass <laughs> So that was taken off the uh, the final kind of mastered version, as you can see there at the bottom, just so we're not taxing the CPU too hard. Because you know, by the time you get up to like 85 channels, I've got a relatively powerful iMac here, but um, it you know it starts struggling just a little bit. So um, yeah, basically this track, it came about. Uh, the original idea kind of came about, I think probably 2018, 2019. Um, I hadn't really had a studio available to me for two or three years. I was going through a whole bunch of kind of life transitions and moving from house to house. I didn't really have the facility to make um, too much noise. So I was I was very sort of uh, limited to some quite basic headphones I had at the time. And um, anyway, this idea just kind of came about very early on when I when I set up the studio in this new place that I've now been in for three years. And, and it was really just one of those ideas that I sat down and threw together in an hour or so. And the original idea um, just consisted of a, a single drum loop and then a really like scuzzy bass sound. Um, 
the idea of the track really in the first place is I, I wanted to make something that was just really inspired by my love of drone rock rather than electronic music and there are electronic artists that kind of do nudge into that area and some indie artists as well that kind of nudge into the electronic domain like stereo lab for example and and you know the chemical brothers as well sometimes on their you know they're more psychedelic they'll perhaps go for a similar approach of this this kind of real density of sounds and all kinds of modular synths going off left right and center with quite a a kind of rock and roll indie style um, aesthetic but w what I wanted to get across here really even though it was based on that love of drone rock um, was a much bigger heavier kind of full spectrum sound that really you can only get from like um, uh, the sort of electronics so looking for some proper subsonics looking for some really kind of fizzy top end and then all that kind of beautiful low mids and and upper mids just to really fill out the spectrum so you know it just becomes like a, a huge overwhelming euphoric kind of sound bath that was my goal I also wanted it to feel compulsively joyous because when I actually came to to write this track we were I think six or seven months into lockdown and um, you know things were pretty tough for a lot of people I, I'd just done a series of um, online live sets actually called We Are One where I was doing three or four hour long live sets um, and using an old APC40 controller to, to come up with these really sort of um, joyous and 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 kind of just happy sets just sets full of of music that wasn't too introspective that certainly wasn't too heavy and would just bring joy to people I just felt like intuitively it was the right thing to be doing at the time so um, and this in a way was an extension of that it's obviously not in that same kind of disco um, it doesn't have that same sort of disco vibe that a lot of the We Are One sets had at, at their root but it still has that sort of compulsive joyousness to it and I wanted something that really felt like pure liberation I wasn't really thinking about audiences at all and I certainly wasn't thinking about whether any DJs would play it um, frankly I'm not really interested I don't really care if they play it or not I know it's something that I would absolutely play possibly as a set closer um, I think it has a, a, a really nice kind of end of night feel to it something to send people away with a big smile on their face but what I wanted to convey was just that feeling that I get when I'm deep on the plier, for example, at Burning Man, when I'm like miles away from anywhere, a huge sound system comes by and I just get lost into this lock groove, this like heavy, beautiful, relentless kind of hypnotic locked groove. You know, I wanted at the heart of this track for the for the drones that are present to feel really loose and organic and and as a result you know to get that to achieve that I did a lot of micro tuning so there's lots of subtle pitch bends where the pitches are just very slowly going up and down across multiple different parts so nothing's ever quite in tune um, everything's constantly morphing and evolving into something else um, I remember this this night out I had many many years ago in um, Los Angeles and this is going to be a horrible name drop so I apologise in advance but I had this night out with Darren Emerson who at the time was in Underworld who one of my all time favourite bands and we had this kind of bizarre night out and we, we were talking a bit about dance music and he, he turned to me at one point in the evening and just said you know the key to dance music is really straightforward and then he just went like this and just said it's just all about layers really layers coming in layers dropping out and that stuck with me for years and years and it very much kind of informs the attitude to this track you know there are multiple layers of drums that come in you can kind of see that from the sequence you can see the way that you know for example these guitar parts like they just they just ramp up um, it's not as kind of brick wall like as it looks from there there's lots of kind of nuances within the parts if you if you look at them so I've kind of bounced them down so they're not 
um, you know, like individual parts have just bounced the parts down. Um, but in all of the parts, like we can look down here at some droners. These are all the keyboard parts that make up this track. And I'll just play a f through a few of these um, in a minute. Um, but they all have these like micro tunings to them and they're all sort of picking up one picks up from another there's lots of dovetailing going on and it really is like an exercise in in just organic flow just trying to get the music just to to feel like it all belongs to one sort of super sized band that's just on stage just rocking out just giving it absolutely everything um, you know the kind of influences for this track certainly not that conventional I think for for a lot of people who are maybe coming at things very much from a dance music background but that's never been my sole interest by by any means and and at times you know dance music has over the years has almost felt a bit like work for me not always by any means but there have been periods of my of my life where it's it's been, it's been the last thing I've wanted to listen to because I've just made so much of it. I've just been on this kind of hamster wheel creating music for DJ shows and for record labels and just driving forward all the time. And it, it's been so nice over the last few years to get off that hamster wheel and just and just reconnect with a lot of those um, those influences that I've had at the core of my music making for years and years. So. A few of the bands that this track is kind of influenced by are people like Can, um, Meat Bodies, Loop, Spiritualized, uh, Velvet Underground, massive influence for me, um, Moon Duo, Noi, Brian Jonestown Massacre, um, Faust, Spaceman 3, Desert Mountain Tribe, you know, those are, and and that really does run the whole gamut of influences going back to the '60s right the way through to the kind of modern era. But all of those bands are very, very capable of just setting up an absolutely compulsive groove and just letting it roll and just bringing those layers on top of each other. But I wanted to to also bring in some um, some of that kind of electronic production. Um, know-how really to to just fatten things up so I'm just going to show you for starters like this is this is the absolute genesis of the idea there's this drum loop that um, that I put together using a, a contact instrument and all of these have long, like long since now been bounced down into into kind of finished audio parts purely because again 85 channels of audio it, it's just you know, it's just backing up the uh, the system too hard. But this was the original drum loop. And it's got that lovely kind of ringing um, pitched snare to it. And so when I was first developing that and putting it through various like distortion processes, making it like a full on kind of garage rock vibe, um, it was that pitch that then suggested something of a kind of bass guitar groove and if we go up to the basses here I think this is the bass guitar groove that came out You can see down here that actually we've got a send here which is being automated just to create like these occasional sections within the track where the bass sound just changes a little bit and, and you'll see these kinds of little bits of automation happening um, all over the place in this track because the goal isn't to have these super sharp cuts the goal is to have sections just flowing into each other in much more of a, um, a, a sort of intuitively live um, sense. We can probably highlight this bass guitar fuzz and just see what's going on here. We've actually got like a guitar rig here with some sort of custom amplification going on and you 
can hear there we've got a bit of phasing going on there at the top end which is all fine by me this nice little uh, electric lady flanger there and that's just giving it that like little bit of psychedelic wash so it's just kind of varying things slightly there on the bass line um, but the whole track the original version of this when I first started working on it like maybe for an hour was to create that idea to create the bass line and then I just had it sitting on the hard drive probably for two years and I, I always make a point whenever I'm working on tracks I always make a point these days to export um, an audio regardless of where I'm at with the track at the end of a day's work at the end of an hour's work even 10 minutes work always export like an audio bounce of what I'm working on because it's way way easier just to audition those completed audio bounces when you're looking at maybe something new to tackle or something that already exists on the hard drive um, so I'd really recommend regardless of how far you've gone down the road with the track just have that bit of audio I'll often put it in a Dropbox folder as well, even just eight bars of audio, just so that I can listen to it at, at, when I'm out and about. I can just put it on when I'm in the car. Just you know, just it just gives me that like little bit of inspiration to go. This is the day that I'm going to make this like beast of a tune, and um, and that's kind of what happened with this. I I almost when I started this track as well, I, I really promised myself that. I wasn't going to go too big with it, you know. I knew it had to be dirty and I knew it had to be garage-like and and all the rest of it. But um, inevitably, like as things evolved, my, my original concept of it was to take that sort of can loop spiritualized velvets um, ethos and rather than have guitars playing all of those parts, I had this idea in my head that I'd have synths playing it. I'd have six or seven different synths. They'd all be detuning. They'd all be oscillating. It'd be this mad kind of like modern day kraut rock type vibe. And it just didn't work out that way. So that little um, that drum loop that I was just playing you that sounds like this. By the time I'd finished with the drums, they ended up sounding like this. But what I like about that is you can see how that particular drum loop has just really been a, like a foundational piece. It's been the cornerstone of the of the drums, and, and everything that's gone on around it has has gone on around it, but has preserved the essence of the loop. So I haven't really changed the pitch of it. I've allowed that essence to still cut through. But everything that goes on around it has just enhanced it. And I'm just going to quickly run through these loops so you can actually hear what they're doing. Some of them might sort of surprise you, but each of these loops and each of these sounds, as we move down the list here, we've got lots of kind of individual sounds here that are in, in sort of pale blue. A lot of these are like reinforcement sounds. And these individual sounds have just been brought in really to fill frequencies that maybe that, you know, that that um, combination of loops that we've started to build up isn't fulfilling. By the time you get to a point where you've got like, I don't know, eight guitars and you've got eight synthesizers and a whole bunch of other crap going on along the top ends and, and all the rest of it. Um, once you get to that level and you've got so much sort of density of information those drums have to be full frequency you know so we have down here at the bottom we have a um an 808 which originally i wasn't really going to um i wasn't going to have something like that subsonic it's not particularly subsonic 808 but it is i mean that's what they are this has got quite a lot of saturation on it but it's just to, to anchor the bottom end of, of all of these loops. Um, that's the purpose. So let's just run through these loops quickly. Nice little bit of cowbell just cutting through now and again, or a rim shot or something. Let's see if you can hear that in the, um, in the overall loop. And 
that that little tiny cowbell click there is just finding its own unique little bit of space and you know it adds a kind of uh, i don't know a sort of looseness to the whole thing this loop's a very like super compressed almost like 80s style loop just gives a little bit more um i don't want to say dirt i don't really know what the word is gives a bit more of that sound listen to these let's listen to these five together these are all the, like the live loops here oh, that's a pretty solid groove right there so let's listen to it again and then i'm gonna i'm gonna add these kicks and snares into the mix here just so you can see what these are doing because these are really giving us some kind of reinforcement So what those are now doing, those additional components, to my ears anyway, is that they're filling in the gaps and they're kind of rounding things off. And they're actually taking the, the disparate nature of all of those loops and they're almost acting like, like glue. And they're just binding things together and bringing things back from that disparate, that idea that, that they're quite disparate, to them once again being almost like a unified kick you know a unified kit like a drummer might be playing and then if we add on these uh, additional components so the additional components i'm going to drop those in just the hats cymbals and tambourines and you'll hear that those those just kind of pace things along because this is a very at the moment this is a very sort of stodgy beat quite deliberately so um, the tambourines give things a real like psychedelic vibe, I think, in this instance. And the hats just give things a little bit more pace. And then the cymbals just ride on top and, and you know, just allow those kind of core moments to really flourish. Tambourines coming up. You can see the tambourines are, you know, there is like some stereo content going on, obviously, in, in some of these loops. But the tambourines particularly are, you know, they're being panned around a little bit in the mix there. And you can see as well, there's quite a bit. I mean, I, I tend not to, to pan drums too heavily left to right, um, especially kicks and snares. Um, but that's where things like reverbs come in, um, just to widen things out a little bit. Um, I think when you're when you're putting your drums together, I think listening, paying really close attention to the stereo field is important, because ultimately, unless you you're really going for a very specific special effect, you don't want sounds to be just pinging off all over the place, all around your head, because it's no longer going to feel like it comes from a sort of unified sound source, and that can be as a special effect that can be can be useful but generally speaking you imagine you go and see a band playing live or whatever you go and see a drummer the sound is simply coming from the drums and yeah it's echoing around the room and all the rest of it and you're getting that kind of spatial feel to it but ultimately um, it's coming from that one sound source and even if you have all these disparate electronic um, elements and they can be placed subtly around in the mix to give it some width you don't want them to be too radically left and right and all over the place for me that's that's one thing that that quite quickly kind of tears a, um, a track apart a little bit so moving on from the drums let's just talk about basses a little bit because I, I do like the um, the bass effect that we have on this track we're actually only using here um, two bass parts. So we have this live bass sound. And, you know, that's that's been treated so that 
a lot of the super bottom end, anything probably below about 50 hertz or so, has been um, has been cut um, because we want to we want to make way for a much more solid uh, bottom end. So I'll play a little bit with the bass as it stands from about here, and then I'll bring in the sub bass, which is coming from this um, serum synth. So the, the serum there is really just replicating exactly what's happening on the bass. And as you can tell, it's not, you know, it's a relatively sort of subtle effect, but it makes a big difference between whether that bass has a real warm bottom end to it or whether it's a little bit choppy and a little bit tinny. And you'll certainly hear that if you um, listen to the track as a whole. <laughs> like all of the warmth just kind of evaporates out of the track because it's just not anchored that much in the bottom end and that's part of the reason going back to the um that 808 kick that we were just looking at down here the very tight 808 part of the reason why i didn't go for something that was an octave lower than that is because it would have just really interfered with what was happening with the sine bass here so the 808 kick in this case you know we're not talking about a kind of hip-hop or, or trap 808 it's not it's this isn't what's really leading the bass the way the 808's been used in this track is just as something that just rounds off the bottom end of those drums um, so that's the the basses let's just have a quick listen as well to these droners um, and I did say, you know, like, there's all these guitar parts. I'm going to come to those in a minute. But I did say, like, the original plan here was um, to allow the drones to lead the track. But as the track kind of escalated, the drones needed to, um, you know, we needed to add to them. But let's just have a quick listen to what's going on. This Zebra 2 um, drone down here is a real kind of core parts of this track but I'll run around like a minute or so of it and we can just listen to what the drone synths are doing here you can see here there's quite a bit of heavy side chaining going on coming from the SC which is our side chain it's the kick basically Lovely little kind of underworld style synth thing I did. So you can see as well, if you look here on the sends that I have here, the Ableton sends, you can see that there's a whole range of different different styles of sort of reverb effects and delays going on these drones. And the point behind that really is to is to kind of exaggerate the differences between them and also ensure that there's this like constant sort of dovetailing effect. When one of them drops out, another one like takes over. And what these effects will do, what the longer reverbs will do, and the um, and the delays, like we have a, an instance here of um, of Echo Boy, and it's quite a wet uh, version of the effect. There's a lot of feedback happening. It's a long evolving dub program that I I put in there, and um, and we can probably just give that a quick listen.
and that's actually coming off that's a, um, a different that's one of the like spacey sci-fi effects but there is some on this so this little spot reverb here at the end of the phrase you can hear how it just kind of fragments and then um, and then sort of fades away um, so those are all the drones there's a whole bunch of them here there's a um, like an Oberheim emulation which I really like the zebra can't remember what I did the uh, this sort of underworldy sound on or or this I think this one was done on uh, Sugar Bites Aparillo, which is another sound design synth I'm I'm pretty fond of. Um, the Underworld one was probably done on the Diva, I'm guessing. And that particular sounds pretty dry in the mix. There's no real effects on there at all. And that's because it doesn't need it, you know. Um, there's so much other stuff going on. You have to be very careful when you're building up a track with as many sounds as this that you don't end up just getting too, like, carried away with all of these sounds. And I did actually keep all of the the original... Um, <coughs> excuse me. Some of the original program parts here. So we have the, um, like, the Oberheim here. Massive swells that one's called, and um, this is a voltage modulator as well. Um, so you know, I tend to do that when I when I bounce tracks down. What I'll do often these days is I'll actually I'll either freeze them or duplicate them, freeze one of them, and then keep the original part just in case I need to um, come back into them uh, at a later date. Um, I think it is, I mean there's not a huge amount more going on here it's really all about the the interplay of the layers but there are several lead lines that um that I just want to talk about briefly before we get to the end of this walkthrough and let's play a bit of the track as a whole now let's just check everything's unmuted I think it is as it should be in fact I'll just play it from the mastered version here and we'll just listen to the way some of these different um, lead lines like work alongside each other because this is a big a big key to the track and especially this second lead line that comes in here um, it really I think it just really elevates the track and like takes it up to a, a, a different level after that that first main drop <laughs> It's the big guitar. And then the uh, second lead coming in now. At the end of this drop. And you can see this lead is actually split into two kind of duplicate parts. This is the main lead that you really pick out when you're listening to it. Really like the rawness of that. It almost sounds like a kind of theremin, but it's um it's a really nice 2600 emulation, I think. The two leads together, so the diva lead that we were just listening to first there, this one. 
that was brought in just to give it a bit more sparkle and to give it a, a bit more kind of consistency within the mix um, in terms of that kind of uh, like upper mid range really and and, and top end. <laughs> Again, it's more brought in as a kind of sound to, to really enhance what we have there as the main lead. Then we also have like a final category of end leads. Again, there's a couple of leads there that are layered on top of each other. So this drone runner lead. Lovely filth coming off those oscillators, that's cool. Again, very fluid, lots of little tweaks going on there in the um, like frequency control and just bringing in bits of additional noise and almost a touch of radio interference. And then the other lead sound there is a bit more of a sort of traditional, like CS80 Blade Runner style sound. We just quieten that down for a second. Oops, wrong button. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So these come in just to, they almost act in counterpoint with what's happening on the. Um, uh, you know the other leads that we just looked at and ah, yeah one last thing I just wanted to talk about with guitars I can't believe I left them till last I probably left them till last because man I, I just don't play the guitar but I love guitar music and given half the chance in the studio I've actually got a, a really nice um, Gibson SG like a 1970s Gibson that I bought a few good few years ago now when I started working on the uh, Piece of Me album because I wanted there to be like a sort of guitar presence on there um, but you know my, my guitar s skills kind of extend pretty much as far as um, you know tuning the guitar in a nice way figuring out a couple of pretty simple changes here and there so what tends to happen um, when I put these guitar parts down occasionally there'll be things that I actually play myself and I'll actually play them live. But more often than not, it'll actually be a case of using plugins and just putting them through a ton of processing until we get them to work. Now, there's a ton of guitar parts on here, really essential to making this track work. <coughs> um, and what they tend to do is they just bring in this like um, this range of frequencies that's very very hard to find. Um, it's very very hard to find on keyboards, you know. Um, there's a sort of roughness to them. I remember I remember when I was uh, like writing in in Lunatic Calm years ago. It was one of the hardest things to do was to try and find guitar sounds that actually sat alongside the electronics. But now with the kind of, you know, the skills that I've developed over the years and also the, the sophistication of the processing that we now have just within the box, um, it's not that difficult to find space. You know, you have to make sure that you're really judicious with um, with the way that you do kind of EQ cuts on sounds, subtractive EQ is super important, and just making way for all of these sounds. So we just listen to a little bit of the guitar parts on their own. Uh, and then we'll hear them um, as part of the track. You can hear there's very there's nothing really happening on the very bottom end there. And there's not too much going on at the very top end either. This is very much a sort of mid-range sound. It's designed to just fatten out the sound as much as possible and give it that live feel. listen to it when they're all in at the end
So that's pretty much it for this uh, Song Explorer, this production walkthrough. Uh, this is Elite Force, Two is Too Too Many is the original track. And if you'd like to hear it in its entirety, please uh, check out the link in the comments um, in the description and that will send you straight to um, either uh, Spotify, or if you're not a fan of Spotify or you don't use it, then it will take you to my uh, Bandcamp page. Anyway, um, let me know if you've got any comments on the track, um, whether there are any specific kind of areas that like really interested you from a production point of view. And also um, drop any requests in the comments of other tracks of mine that you'd like to see me try and unpick. I do think it's worth bearing in mind, however, that uh, a lot of tracks you know, prior to like 2013 or whatever, it's going to be very hard for me to find any of the sort of original um, uh, like program content. A lot of the Ableton content's uh, no longer available for one reason or another. Thank you. Hard drive crashes. Um, but uh, but I'm certainly willing to, 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 to have a look. And I've actually been doing some work recently on w rebuilding one or two tracks, like in the first episode of the song explorer where i did leave you far behind by lunatic calm so that's certainly something that i consider uh but drop your comments in the comment section and uh, i look forward to seeing you again in a month or so for another song explorer <laughs>